Welcome to the Fifth Estate. Marshal Milgard Moran, these names now represent painful reminders of the fallibility of the police and lawyers, judges and juries. But before them all, there was Stephen Truscott. In 1959, when a 12-year-old girl disappeared on a hot June evening, an investigation lasting less than two days and a trial of less than two weeks sent a 14-year-old schoolboy on his way to the gallows. Stephen Truscott's murder trial was the most famous and infamous child criminal case in Canadian history. His death sentence was commuted, but he spent 10 years in prison. Since his release, Truscott has lived a secret life under an assumed name, shunning all publicity until now. Tonight he breaks that 40-year silence. The Fifth Estate has reviewed the documentation in this case, interviewed dozens of witnesses, and followed leads ignored by the police at the time. And we've uncovered some astonishing new evidence, a long-hidden file whose contents raise disturbing questions about the integrity of the murder investigation and the fairness of his trial. Stephen Truscott's guilt is a historical fact, but is it true? Was the verdict just? He still maintains his innocence, but after four decades, it is now his word against history. And now, posterity must judge. In tonight's program, key scenes are recreated based on verbatim accounts of witnesses and from military, police, and archival documents. In a Goderich, Ontario jail cell, he awaited the hangman. He was 14. I woke up one day and uh, somebody was building something outside the wall. You could hear the hammering and oh, I thought they were building the scaffold. Um, and it's just uh, kind of living in terror. And every, every day you expected it to be your last. It was 1959, and his name was Stephen Truscott. Once his jailers saw his brother climbing a tree to catch a glimpse of him. So they moved the prisoner to a cell without a window. The cell is lonely, the cell is cold. October is young, but the boy is old. Too old to cringe, and too old to cry, though young but never too young to die. At last we have something to boast about. We've a national law in the name of the Queen to hang a child who is just 14. Columnist Pierre Burton broke journalistic conventions and wrote a bitter poem about the death sentence, a rare display of outrage amid all the sensational news stories. But it was 1959 when Canada still had mainly rural and small town roots. A time of prosperity and order. People still presumed the infallibility of institutions like the justice system. In the summer of that year, just outside the Air Force base at Clinton, Ontario, a single tragic incident would shatter many assumptions about the innocence of youth and about the safety of children. For days there had been a heat wave. It was near the end of the school year. The children were restless. Two of them set out on a bike ride that would carry them into Canadian legal history. The girl was Lynn Harper, aged 12. The boy was one of her classmates, Stephen Truscott, aged 14. Two days later, searchers found her body in a wooded grove. In the more than 40 years since, there has been much controversy about what really happened on that evening. Partly because of it, Canadians abolished the death penalty. In that time, one voice has been absent from the debate, that of Stephen Truscott. He has chosen to live in a closed privacy until now. It's important to me. I know uh, that uh, they got the wrong person. My kids are all growing up. Um, we've discussed it as a family and uh, we figured it was time to come out. 
His life was frozen in the 50s. After years in prison, he took a new name, married, had children, watched them grow, eventually told them his grim story, how he became the central figure in one of Canada's best-known murder cases. His daughter Leslie remembers when the Truscott case came up in school as a class project. After class, I went to my teacher and I said, um, please tell me that we're not going to do any more on this subject. And he says, why does it bother you? And I said, yes, it does. And he says, well, it bothers me too to see an innocent man sit in jail for 10 years for something he didn't do. And I said, well, it bothers me for a different reason. And he said, oh, really? And I said, yes. I said, he's my father. He rarely revisits the place where his life changed so dramatically when he was 14. June 9th, 1959, a small bridge over a slow river. It was all you needed when you were 14 and life was coming into focus. Stephen was popular and athletic, usually at the river with the other boys or on the playing fields at the school. That's where he was on his bike at 7 in the evening, June 9th. Lynn Harper was also there. She was the daughter of an officer on the Clinton base. Lynn Harper came over to the bike and more or less asked me what I was doing and I said, well, I'm going down to the river to see if any of the kids are down there. And she asked me if she could have a ride down to the highway. I thought, well, I'm going down that way anyhow. A so, tiny little moment. Yeah, a tiny little moment that uh, kind of changed everybody's life. He says that Lynn told him that she'd squabbled with her parents at supper time. She wanted to go to the main highway, and from there she was going to a place where there were ponies. Along the way, they passed a wheat field and a grove of trees known as Farmer Lawson's Bush. A couple of minutes further on, they crossed the bridge spanning the little river. He says he dropped her at highway number eight. Then he rode back to the bridge where he stopped to watch the other kids playing in the water. He glanced toward the highway once and saw a car pull up. It was a 59 Chev Gray. And uh, as it swung in and started to pull back out, there was something orange on the back of it. I couldn't tell whether it was a license plate or a sticker or whatever. That was the first year that Chev changed the style of the car. And they had large fins going out like wings. And the tail lights looked like cat's eyes. And uh, there was no other car around like that. Police came here during the investigation, they did tests, and they later testified that you just couldn't see a car from that distance, let alone an orange or yellow sticker on the back of it. That's what, that was what I saw, and I maintain that today. By his reckoning, it would have been just after 7.30 when she drove off in the strange car. The police at first thought she'd run away. By Thursday, the military organized a large search party to sweep the area, starting at the school, heading north toward Farmer Lawson's bush. That afternoon, they found her body, sexually assaulted and strangled. George Edens was a young airman then. First thing I saw was her clothes. And uh, her clothes were laying there rather neatly, I thought. And I thought, why would a little girl be out here without any clothes on? And then I looked at her and I thought, oh, my heavens, no. I knew then what, you know, that she was dead. Among the Ontario Provincial Police officers at the scene, a senior investigator from headquarters in Toronto, Inspector Harold Graham, would head the investigation. And it wouldn't take him long to crack the case wide open. In an area with thousands of transient young men in the military and civilian populations, there might have been many suspects. But Inspector Graham quickly found his prime suspect in the elementary school. They found her body Thursday afternoon. Friday evening, they picked up Stephen Truscott. The uh, police officer got out and he says, uh, get in the car. Well, I mean, back then, uh, when you're 14 years old and... Uh, 
you kind of looked up to the police. Uh, when they told you to get in the car, you got in the car. Later, they brought him to the base guardhouse. Then they told his parents. Their Friday night interrogation would go on for more than seven hours. Frightened and exhausted and without a lawyer present, he was under constant pressure to confess. He refused. They would take turns coming in and questioning me, and then the next one would come in and call me a liar, and uh, you did this, you did that. Eventually, he became confused, made mistakes, stuck to a story about seeing five boys swimming while he watched from the bridge, got two of them wrong, told the family doctor he could have molested Lynn, but couldn't remember. On Saturday morning, after less than two days of investigation, they charged the boy with murder. One cop says after be, being there uh, just overnight, this is our suspect. We're charging this person. I mean, what happened to the word investigation? Have you got to boil down to any kind of a reason why this happened to you? It was the easiest route out for them. And the 14-year-old kid was the uh, easiest possible way. The first reaction to the arrest was one of relief that the killer had been captured. And there was a bonus. He was a kid, a nobody. He wasn't a serviceman, so the military were spared embarrassment. He wasn't a civilian, so there was no danger of backlash from the base. The bad news was that the police really didn't have much of a case against him, other than having been seen with the victim while she was still alive. And much of the evidence came from a lot of contradictory stories out of the mouths of children. The stories were about who saw what and when on this road from the school to the river past Farmer Lawson's bush, which is on the right, about halfway up. If Stephen and Lynn left the school and drove past the bush over the river to number eight highway, as he insisted they did, he was innocent. The police were convinced he was lying, that they really turned off the road and into the bush. Their challenge was to prove it. There had to be a motive for stopping by the bush, and one of the kids from the school handed them the oldest one in the book, sex. A girl named Jocelyn Godette claimed that on the day before the murder, Truscott had made a secret date to meet her in the bush, suggesting that his teenage hormones were on the boil. The alleged date would become crucial evidence against him. That never Where happened. Get, where did she get that notion? I couldn't even begin to tell you. It never took place. Jocelyn would later testify that just before six on the evening of the murder, he stopped by her house to remind her of their date. However, we've discovered notes that cast doubt on that testimony. They're from an early interview with the police, one of several, and there's no reference at all to that visit. She would testify that she went to the bush looking for Stephen that evening. But these police notes by Inspector Harold Graham record that Jocelyn first said she'd been looking not for Stephen Truscott, but for Lynn Harper. And an incident during Truscott's trial, never previously revealed, raises questions about her credibility. She testified that she was also looking for Stephen at Lawson's farm, not far from the bush. She got her time wrong by an hour. So during the trial, she went to see farmer Bob Lawson to ask for a favor. It was one evening, there again, I was uh, getting the cows in to do the milking, and uh, she wanted me to change the time that she was over to coincide with the time that she had told them that she had been over. She wanted you to change your story? That's right. Did you give her a response? No, I said I can't do that. The police picked up a more damaging story from another boy, Butch George. A good friend of Stevens was spreading it among the other guys the night Lynn disappeared. One of the guys was Alan Dernan, who was 11 at the time. Butchy George stopped, and he said to me, Truscott's in the bush with Harper. What it meant was that he, he was in with a bush with Harper trying to do whatever 14-year-old boys do. That should have been conclusive an eyewitness who placed the suspect at the scene of the crime. But it would become one of the great mysteries of the Truscott case, 
that the police never asked Butch George where and when he made this incriminating observation. And while the prosecution got other kids to testify in minute detail about what they saw and didn't see that night, they never asked Butch George to repeat under oath the extraordinary claim that he saw Lynn and Stephen in the bush. Maybe it was because Butch had a credibility problem. The night Lynn Harper disappeared, Jocelyn Godette said she bumped into Butch on the road just beside the bush, and she asked if he'd seen Stephen. Butch said no. Later that evening, Butch dropped by Stephen's house and they tossed a ball around for a while. He later told the police they didn't talk about Lynn, then that they did. That he saw Stephen down by the bridge earlier that evening, then that he didn't. That he only said so because Stephen asked him to. Alan Dernan was one of the kids who thought Stephen was guilty, but Butch George's contradictions almost made Truscott look innocent. Every time Butchie was called up to the stand to give some kind of evidence or to answer a question or whatever, he changed his story every trip. So I think that the prosecution must have just got to the point where, what do we believe? You know, is it, can this guy tell the truth or can he get his story straight or is there something wrong with him? Of the dozens of children and adults on the county road that hot June evening, nobody could reliably place Stephen in or near the bush where Lynn's body was later found. Then the police introduced some interesting reverse logic. To prove that Stephen and Lynn had gone into the bush, they only had to prove that at some point they weren't on the road. Enter little Philip Burns. He was 10 and he was supposed to be home early. He started walking just after seven. A boy on a bike passed him. The kid on the bike said he met Lynn and Stephen on Stephen's bike up near the school. But Philip said he didn't meet them. The prosecution would persuade a jury that if he didn't meet them on the road, it could only mean that they'd gone into the bush. But a close reading of Philip's police statement suggests that there were a number of people he didn't see on the road that night, people who said they'd seen him, which shouldn't be particularly surprising for a 10-year-old on an evening that was still unremarkable. Nothing spectacular was going on. People are swimming, people are riding up and down the road. Nobody really has any reason to pay, to, uh, pay particular attention. Maybe Stephen and Lynn did take a little trip up by the edge of the woods. Explains everything, people coming and going and not seeing it. No, it never happened. It didn't happen? It didn't happen. I picked her up at the school, right down to the highway. No detours? No detours. But yet, Butch, George, who was one of your close friends, says that you and Lynn were in the woods, and, and Butch is insinuating that he saw you in the woods. It was more or less a joke. It started off to be a joke, I think, more or less. Uh, young kids saying, oh, I saw you with a girl, or uh, what started off to be a joke all of a sudden when the police got hold of it was no longer a joke. But two other witnesses would strike a serious blow at the prosecution theory. Remember the geography. If Stephen and Lynn crossed the bridge, he could not have killed her in the bush. And two witnesses insisted they saw them cross the bridge, riding double on his bike. One of them was an 11-year-old who was at the river catching turtles. As he climbed the embankment to the bridge to go home, he said that Stephen and Lynn rode by. His name was Dougie Oates, and more than 40 years later, he's still positive that he saw them. I uh, recall uh, saying hi and waving at them, and uh, Lynn smiling back. I don't recall any real reaction from, from Stephen uh, as he was pedaling down the road heading, heading towards Highway Number 8. No doubt in your mind about it? There is absolutely no doubt in my mind. I saw both of them. Well, I couldn't see one of them without the other, but they were both, uh, r they were riding double on Steve's bike across the river. You see, if your memory is sharp, then Stephen Truscott is innocent. I don't know how anybody could have come to any other conclusion. I could see that maybe being dismissed if I was the only one that had seen them cross the bridge, but 
In fact, I know I'm not the only one that saw them cross the bridge. Gordon Logan, who was 12, was fishing in the river. He told police he looked up and saw Stephen and Lynn drive by. Shortly afterwards, he saw Stephen coming back alone, presumably after dropping Lynn at the highway. His story is significant because he reported it to the police on Thursday morning, before they found Lynn's body. Later, when it became crucial to Stephen's alibi, the police said he made it up to protect his friend, that the bridge was too far away to see anybody on it clearly. But we've discovered police records indicating the opposite. In a real test later on, a policeman standing where Gord Logan stood precisely identified clothing and colors and concluded that someone on the bridge would have been recognizable. But at the trial, the prosecution was able to persuade the jury that the boys who had seen Truscott and Harper cross the bridge were just part of a conspiracy of pals out to protect him, Doug Oates. When you think about it logically, I mean, at, at, at the ripe age of 11 years old, you know, we would have had been extremely sophisticated to be able to put uh, together stories like that. So you can sit in front of me today and in front of the whole country and say what you said with such ferocity back then, that you were not a liar. No, no. I, I saw Steve Trescott and Lynn Harper cross the bridge heading north towards highway number eight on that evening. And there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. When we come back, how flawed medical evidence nearly sent Stephen Truscott to the gallows. I don't think there is any uh, medical or forensic evidence which clearly links Stephen Truscott with Lynn Harper's death. The prosecution's case against Stephen Truscott wasn't going to get very far on their shaky testimony of children. They needed objective evidence. And what could be more objective than science? And what the prosecution's child witnesses might have lacked in certainty, several doctors involved in the Truscott case more than made up for, testifying with inspired confidence that Lynn Harper had died in exactly that half hour that she'd been with Stephen Truscott. Lynn Harper left home at about 6.15. She met up with Stephen just after 7. People saw Stephen around the base at 8, and shortly after that he was home, babysitting for the rest of the evening. To prove that he killed Lynn Harper, the prosecution would have to prove she died between 7.15 and a quarter to 8. The local coroner was Dr. John Penniston, Relying mainly on the analysis of Lynn's stomach contents, he placed the time of death precisely in that half-hour window, an astonishing precision even with the forensic tools available today. It was such a crucial piece of evidence that we asked for some expert opinions on the validity of Dr. Penniston's conclusions. Dr. John Butt is former chief medical examiner for Nova Scotia. Years working mostly as a prosecution expert have taught him to be very careful drawing conclusions from stomach contents. I mean, I think the one thing that you can learn is perhaps uh, what the person ate at the last meal. I don't think it tells you anything precise about the time of death. Well, it sure told <laughs> the police and the, and the pathologists of the time a lot. It told well, them that she died sometime <clears throat> between 7.15 and 7.30 on the night of June the 9th. Well, the big question here is whether or not that information that was said to have been developed from the stomach contents, quote unquote scientifically, was meeting some predetermined parameter. A polite way of saying that Dr. Penniston might have been tailoring his conclusions to substantiate the suspicions of policemen. It was difficult to challenge Dr. Penniston's conclusions since the prosecution never entered his official autopsy report into evidence. I don't think there is any uh, medical or forensic evidence which clearly links Stephen Truscott with Lynn Harper's death. Dr. Rex Ferris is a veteran pathologist from Vancouver. We also asked him to review the medical testimony. He found Dr. Penniston's claims to be extraordinary, given the quality of information available to him from a decomposing body. How impressed are you with the basis on which they nailed down a fairly, uh, you know, fairly precise time of death? 
Well, I, I, I'm not impressed at all. I think the bottom line is that uh, they, uh, there really was no valid uh, method used to determine time of death. Under the best of circumstances, determination of time of death on a dead body may be very difficult, if not impossible. Surprisingly, Dr. Penniston himself came to the same conclusion years later, reviewing his own conclusions about the time of death based on stomach contents. He said that he might have been accurate, but that they were not incompatible with death at a later time, up to 12 hours or even longer. The definition by time, in this case, is wrong. Stephen Trescott then should never have been found guilty. If that was the if that was the lynch pin, the answer is he should not have been. If that was what was used to wrap the parcel, it should have fallen apart. The case against Truscott didn't fall apart. In fact, he was damned by even more dubious medical evidence. Two doctors who examined the boy three days after the murder said they found two large lesions on his penis, each the size of a quarter. Truscott, at 14, was mortified trying to explain injuries which he still insists were grossly exaggerated to shock prudish members of the jury. To hear these two doctors describe it in court, um, I was probably the best built 14 year old kid in the world at that time, according to them. No, these two doctors exaggerated so, they blew it all out of proportion. And they got away with it. The fifth estate uncovered evidence that backs him up. The day after that examination, there was another. A third doctor examined him in the Goderidge jail. And according to the jailhouse report, which never surfaced at his trial, he had not observed any injury on the penis. In fact, forensic experts like Dr. Russell Davis of London, England, who has worked with the police on hundreds of rape investigations, argue that a rape rarely produces sores like those described on Truscott. My overall impression, reading these papers, is that the medical evidence was far too precise in situations where you can't afford to be precise because the margins of error are very big. It's almost as if they were fitting the evidence to the guilt of the crime. If the police profile of the murderer was correct, Lynn Harper's killer would have had injuries that were far more conspicuous. This note by Inspector Graham in the early hours of the investigation advised his officers to look especially for someone with scratches on face, neck, hands, and arms. The prosecution would later claim that Stephen Truscott lured Lynn down the lane, somehow knocked her unconscious, dragged her through a barbed wire fence, then carried her limp and bleeding into the bush where he raped and strangled her. But Stephen arrived at the school just minutes after the supposed time of death, and according to every single eyewitness who saw him there, was behaving normally. Unscratched, unbloodied, and unbothered. That should have eliminated him as a suspect. It didn't. Yeah, it was almost like a, a gravel road down this way. And um, uh, there was a barbed wire fence all along the front. They said I, I went back in the bush and killed and raped her. And no marks on you? No. No dirt? No marks, no dirt, no blood, nothing. She had a big cut down her leg, marks on her back. To do all that out here without anybody seeing you, because the road is just back to the, the side here, uh, it was impossible to have happened. The wheels of justice were turning quickly in June of 1959. Ninety days after he was arrested, he went on trial as an adult in the Huron County Courthouse in Goderich. His parents never doubted him. 
but shortly after his arrest, the military transferred his father, Dan Truscott, to Ottawa, 800 kilometers away. They rented a trailer in Goderidge near the jail and not far from the courthouse where the trial would take place. The trial was over only 15 days after it started. An all-male jury recoiled at evidence about rape and penis lesions and found him guilty. Some jurors later called him an animal and a sexual stud. The judge pronounced the sentence that on the 8th of December, he would be hanged by the neck until he was dead. All the time that it's going on, you're thinking they're going to realize that they made a mistake and, uh, you know, they're going to let me, let me go. Uh, but it just never happened that way. Doug Oates, who was 11 and who had endured a withering cross-examination as he insisted on Truscott's innocence, was stunned. I was flabbergasted. I just couldn't believe, you know, the, the fact that you can convict somebody or find somebody guilty and um, with really no evidence other than circumstantial evidence. I think that's just abhorrent. Pierre Burton's poem in the Toronto Star never questioned the verdict, just the death sentence, but it provoked a violent backlash. It was savage. One man phoned and said, I, I hope your daughter is, is raped by a sex fiend. Another woman wrote and said, a hanging is too good for him, he ought to be whipped before he is hanged. The death sentence was postponed to the new year. Then, early in 1960, the federal government commuted it to life imprisonment. Uh, it, it's really, really kind of terrifying. Nighttime, you'd lay there and cry, but it doesn't really accomplish that much. So after a while, um, you even stop doing that. You kind of harden yourself up for what's, what's to come. This was what he had ahead of him. After a few years in a youth facility, Collins Bay Penitentiary near Kingston, a tough prison that's known among convicts as Gladiator School. Max Steinberg was a no-nonsense chaplain at Collins Bay, and he wondered about Truscott's chances for survival. I asked him about that. I said, how could you possibly make the adjustment from a 14-year-old from a boy riding your bike around the community and so on and so forth to facing life? And uh, his answer was something to the effect, you either, you either adjust or you die. And he adjusted. He adjusted, but remained rigid in his claim of innocence. Even as prison psychologists probed his subconscious with truth serum and LSD for secret signs of his guilt. And this is what the psychiatrists all were hinting at. Boy, you don't remember. So I said, hey. I know I'm not guilty. Whatever tests you want to do, I'll go along with them. And nothing came up to uh, indicate that uh, there was any guilt. Was there any moment in, in the testing or in the prior to the testing that you felt, you, maybe I did it, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they are going to find something in here? No, none at all. As the children of Truscott's generation came of age in the mid-60s, his case found new life. Many protesters saw Truscott as a victim of corrupt authority. A more aggressive media began to challenge institutions like the courts and the police. I'm Patrick Watson, and this is our report on the last seven days. The CBC's This Hour Has Seven Days showcased a new book on the Truscott case. It was a blunt critique of Truscott's trial, written by Isabel Laborde. I got hold of the transcript of the trial and began to read it, and soon came to the conclusion that it wasn't, it wasn't a sick boy who was guilty, but a perfectly normal boy who was innocent. After a lot of public pressure, the Supreme Court of Canada decided to review his case to determine whether or not he deserved a new trial. They decided eight to one that he didn't. He never testified at his original trial, and when he appeared before the Supreme Court, they said they found his testimony vague and confused. He admits he went to the highest court in the land scared and unprepared. At the Supreme Court hearing when they uh started asking you questions. A lot of them you don't remember clearly. You're saying you went into the Supreme Court cold? You didn't do your homework? 
how are you supposed to do your homework? You're off to the side. This doesn't involve you. It's a legal issue. Stephen, why didn't you just say, gimme? Like, it's your life. Yeah, but you're in jail. Um, <laughs> I think after so many years of nobody believing you, I mean, for so many years, they're not interested. They couldn't care less. You don't matter. It was his last shot at vindication for a long time. When we come back, new hope in a long hidden file. The military abandoned the Clinton Air Force Base in 1971. It survives only as a footnote in one of Canada's most troubling criminal cases. But before it closed, a senior Air Force officer made a discovery that decades later raises grave questions about the integrity of the investigation of Lynn Harper's murder. He found a misplaced psychiatric file from 1959, and reading it, he felt a chill. The subject of the file was a sexual predator, who also sounded like a killer. The file subsequently disappeared for nearly 40 years, Recently, an investigation by the Fifth Estate, assisted by the National Archives in Ottawa, retrieved that file. Part of a 900-page dossier on Sergeant Alexander Kalachuk. Sergeant Kalachuk was a troubled man, a heavy drinker with a history of sexual offenses. He lived in this farmhouse with his wife and three children, less than a 20-minute drive from the Clinton base. He worked as a supply technician there until 1957. He transferred to another base in Aylmer, about an hour's drive away. But he made frequent trips back to Clinton, where Lynn Harper's father was the senior supply officer. Kalachuk's record of sex offenses went back at least a decade. In 1950, he had two convictions for indecent exposure in Trenton, where he was stationed. Just about three weeks before Lynn Harper's murder, he stopped three young farm girls on a country road outside St. Thomas, Ontario. He tried to lure one of them, a 10-year-old, into his car, offering a gift of new underwear. He left when he saw the girl's father approaching, but was later arrested by the OPP and charged. A week later, a judge dismissed the charge for lack of evidence. Before he let him go, the judge gave Kalachuk a stern lecture, making it clear that he knew what he'd been up to. It seems quite unlikely that the police wouldn't have felt the same and kept an open file on him, even though he'd walked away scot-free this time. It was on May 28th that Kalachuk walked out of that courthouse a free man. Twelve days later, near the Clinton Air Base, where he'd recently been stationed and continued to visit, 12-year-old Lynn Harper was murdered. Remarkably, we've been unable to uncover any evidence that Sergeant Kalachuk was ever considered a possible suspect. And it is clear that once suspicion fell on Stephen Truscott, there was no discernible interest in anybody else, either by the police or by the military brass. And yet at the very moment that Lynn Harper was supposedly hitchhiking toward the town of Seaforth, Kalachuk may well have been in the area. His military records reveal that earlier on that same day, Air Force medical officers were discussing his weakness for alcohol and little girls. They met with a probation officer who was reporting another incident of indecent exposure involving Kalachuk, this time in Seaforth, a few miles from the Clinton base. And back at the Aylmer base, where he worked most of the time, a medical doctor opened a file on Sergeant Alexander Kalachuk. On July 2nd, three weeks after Lynn Harper was murdered, Kalachuk is said to be suffering from overwhelming anxiety, tension, depression, and guilt. The senior medical officer was blunt in his diagnosis. His problem was sexual deviation and anxiety reaction. 
Palachuk entered hospital July 22nd, still described as tense, nervous, and suffering from anxiety and depression, a strong overreaction if he was simply worried about a minor charge that had been dismissed almost two months earlier. Kalachuk was released, but apparently far from cured. A heavily censored confidential military memo about Sergeant Kalachuk's aberrations warned cryptically that when he was later posted at a base near Clinton, ongoing incidents were serious enough to get into the local paper. In fact, police were warning about the activities of an unidentified molester who was preying on young girls from a car. Through all of which, Sergeant Kalachuk managed to avoid particular attention as a suspect in those incidents, and most significantly of all, in the murder of 12-year-old Lynn Harper. That would change when an Air Force flight lieutenant named Willard Bud Longley later stumbled across Kalachuk's psychiatric file at the Clinton base. Longley got permission to conduct an investigation which lasted for three months in the mid-60s, and it reinforced his darkest suspicions. He uncovered Kalachuk's history of sexual crimes. He discovered that Kalachuk had sold his car shortly after the Harper murder. He tried to track Kalachuk's movements the night of the crime. Longley says he eventually met the man who arrested Truscott, Harold Graham of the OPP, at the Clinton base to discuss his findings. He says Graham wasn't interested. Harold Graham, famous as the man who cracked the Truscott case, had risen by then to the office of assistant commissioner and would eventually go on to head the OPP. Hello, uh, Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, now retired, declined an on-camera interview, but spoke to us on the telephone. Sergeant Kalachuk had a record as a sexual offender and had been arrested um, in, by the OPP uh, on the 21st of May. That's uh, just before the dress cut. Yeah, it's just a couple of weeks before the murder. Does any of this sound familiar to you, Mr. Graham? No, it doesn't strike a note at all. The Air Force investigator tells us that he actually briefed you on the Kalachuk file. I would pick up on any sex offender that came to my attention that might be of, of uh, some interest. Yeah. And I'm, I don't remember Kalachuk, the name, nor the meeting that he says, or somebody said, uh, I had with him. Today, the OPP refuses to say if they have ever investigated Sergeant Alexander Kalachuk. Longley had nowhere else to turn with his Kalachuk inquiries and handed his findings over to the Air Force. Today, military archivists say they have no record of what happened to his reports. Kalachuk continued a downward spiral through the 60s and 70s. There were drunk driving charges, and as late as 1969, a military doctor noted that there were still official concerns about his peculiar behavior towards young girls. That same year, 1969, in October, Stephen Truscott left Collins Bay Penitentiary on parole. He was 24. He would never again return to prison, but he'd never really be free either, as long as he was branded a murderer. He moved into the home of Max Steinberg, who was by then a member of the National Parole Board. Steinberg was known in the world of corrections as an old-fashioned hardliner, but he'd developed a deep respect for Truscott, and on his release took him into his own family. Did you ever have any cause to regret that? Not one minute. Personally, I have a great deal of trouble believing that he was guilty uh, because he's a, as I say, he's a very gentle person. Uh, and I don't see that type of, of, uh, of emotion in him that, uh, that, would, that, would, that would lead him to commit that type of an offense. Truscott eventually married and settled down under a different name in Guelph, Ontario, where he's worked steadily as a millwright. After 30 years, his record as a citizen is unblemished. As time passed, even the justice system seemed to forget about him, but anonymity also became a kind of prison for him and for his children. When his father died, he had to tell his kids they couldn't attend the funeral. Leslie never forgot it. For fear of reporters, 
they didn't want pictures taken of us. And I can remember sitting at my aunt and uncle's, just crying and crying, wanting to go to my grandfather's funeral, and I couldn't. I want to put an electric fan on it. His youngest son, Devin, is 17. Stephen Truscott decided early on only to tell his children who he really was when they became teenagers. Leslie and her brother Ryan say the truth only deepened their admiration for their father. Did you ever have any doubt that, my gosh, there's a dark side to my father that I didn't know about? No. No. Never crossed your mind? Never. My dad is the most laid back, relaxed person I've ever met in my life. It's just. I'm sure everything that he went through with all the time in jail and that has really molded the wonderful person that he's, that he's become. And I guess I just couldn't imagine going through having all of my rights taken away from me, having my family taken away, everything taken away from me, and to be able to live through to tell about it. People talk about heroes all the time and who do you admire and who's your hero in your life? And we don't even have to go anywhere but our house. I've got the other box that uh, came in. The murder of Lynn Harper and his conviction have become, not surprisingly, an obsession for Stephen Truscott and his wife Marlene, who has absorbed an encyclopedic knowledge of his case. At the same time. And, uh... But Philip Burns was supposed to have left the bridge and walked home, and according to the uh, the police files, it took him 30 minutes right from there. I've taken things day by day. I've taken them um, witness by witness. I've gone over it and over it and over it. And it all amounts to one thing. They were on a quest. It's him they have in mind. So, in, so while they're getting all this information to have him convicted, the murderer runs free. In 1997, Truscott was briefly hopeful that breakthroughs in DNA testing would finally vindicate him. But after months of searching, authorities could only turn up this list showing that most of the key evidence where the killer's genetic material might be found had been destroyed. Genetic testing might have solved the mystery once and for all, but no one will ever know beyond a reasonable doubt who killed Lynn Harper. Sergeant Alexander Kalachuk lies in a grave in Seaforth, at rest after a tortured life. He spent his final years in and out of psychiatric institutions, and when he was out, was usually lost in a haze of alcoholism, which eventually killed him in 1975. The man who, in the eyes of the law, is the murderer, is now enjoying a serene middle age at peace with himself and his family, and after 30 years, preparing to resume his real identity and his name, Stephen Truscott. Determined to continue the effort to prove his innocence, even though he knows it's now his word against history. Why it's so important for you guys, as a couple, as a family, to keep pursuing this. Uh, whether he did it or not, he, he's scot-free, he did his time, he, he owes nothing to society. He so. is not scot-free. He goes to bed every night as a convicted murderer and he wakes up every morning as a convicted murderer. Why should he be? I, I want to see justice done. Justice hasn't been done. Not to uh, the Harper family and not to uh, my family. So I mean for both families. Um, it's all I want. I, after 40 years, I don't think that's too much to ask. <laughs>